well. Let's take a look at the tail of the tape. A decade difference between the two. The weight pretty much the same. Big height advantage for Holyfield. And with that comes a reach advantage of almost six inches. So ahead, live on Wide World of Sports, the 15-round junior heavyweight fight for Cowie's World Boxing Association title. Stay with us. We'll come back in just a moment. Boxing Asylum listeners and welcome back to Punches from the Past, the show where we delve into boxing's rich history and talk about the fights that really mattered. This week we travel back in time to July the 12th 1986 and Atlanta, Georgia, where Dwight Muhammad Kawi was defending his WBA cruiserweight title against hometown hero Evander Holyfield. The bell rings and this is round one, scheduled to go 15 for the junior heavyweight title that belongs at least for the moment, to Dwight Muhammad Cowie. Entering the ring in Oli's 12th contest as a pro, inexperienced Holyfield had been perceivably jobbed at the 1984 Olympics and was making his way as a fledgling professional pugilist. Cowie, on the other hand, had no amateur record to speak of and the diminutive Camden buzzsaw had learned his trade in prison, sparring and later fighting with the likes of James Scott, who infamously boxed while incarcerated inside railway state prison even fighting into contention for a WBA light heavyweight crack while behind bars. Carwe, or Dwight Braxton as he was originally known before converting to Islam, was a fearless slab of granite and was not coming into Evander's backyard to hand his title over easily. Andy, take us away. Really good fighter, mate. He really was a really good fighter today, especially at his prime, 175, maybe early doors at, at Cruiserweight. He was really good. I mean, just looking at his resume, he was ex-WBC champ, but, you know, beating the likes of Matthew said Mohammed, uh, 1981, you know, 10th round stoppage. You know, his defence against Jerry Martin, uh, the rematch against uh, Sad Mohammed and Eddie Davis, these guys were all kind of top-end, light heavyweights at the time, especially around about a time when a division that was still kind of really, at that point, was you know, struggling again for recognition. He did loads of title to Spink, so, um, but as you say, he had no amateur experience, you know, he'd, he'd done um, something like four years for Ram Robbery in 1974, and he took in when he was released, I think he was age 25, he turned pro, zero, zero uh, amateur experience and stuff, and if you look at him, especially the, the way he actually fought and stuff, you know, a lot of people, especially that I was researching, that would call him Tyskin-esque, but if you actually look at, at the style and how he fought, he was actually kind of resembling Joe Frazier. Um, you know, he went all the way to South Africa and picked up the WBA crown. A really good performance against Pyatt Cross. Um, I think it was a 11th round knockout as well. As, and then um, he beat Leon Spinks in the first defence. If, if you if you actually, if anybody's actually seen that fight, you actually see Kyle Wee actually clowning Leon Spinks, he tries to kind of hit him with kind of like three or four rapid left hooks, and he just, just he just kind of dodges dodges each one of them, just smells back at him. Uh, as for Holyfield, actually going into that fight, there was a, there was a question mark about his stamina actually, so they kind of put him on this project called uh, I think it was the, the Omega Project that Lou Duva and his uh, his long term trainer would put him in and actually stuff like this. This was obviously kind of in the build up to get uh, Holyfield eventually got to heavyweight. 
Um, you know, but it was, it was a big, big step up. I mean, the both fighters are light heavyweights. So Vander outgrew that division. I think Dwight ate himself out of that division. I think he's carrying excess poundage, and that has to hurt his reflexes and his speed. And yet he still thinks he can go up to the heavyweight division. Dwight Muhammad Kelly was 26-2-1, 15 knockouts, travelled the travelled the place, went into prison and fought as you say James Scott, um, won there, um, and then obviously Holyfield at 11 and 0, eight knockouts, um, 23 years old as well. You know there was a lot, a lot of kind of question marks from going into that fight because um, I don't think he'd been any many further than eight rounds, and you know again as I say, could he go the 15? Um, obviously again supporting at ringside was his Olympic teammates, Sweet P. Whitaker, Mildred Taylor. Tyrell Biggs, Mark Breland, you know, probably the, the last great American Olympic squad that picked up all those medals back in 1984. But, um, yeah, really, really, uh, well, we'll get into the fight just now, I suppose, but um, if you think about it as well, as we talk about no amateur experience on Cal Wee's part, there was absolutely no pro experience in questionable stanima on, uh, on Holyfield's part. And again, as I says, you know, July in, in, in Atlanta as well, is, it's, it's absolutely muggy as anything. Uh, and you talk about Holyfield as well as he didn't really have kind of the best starts, you know, because you know, born in Georgia and kind of grew up in Atlanta, it's hardly like in a hot bed of boxing, is it? So, you know, he done well to kind of even even get as far as he did in the Olympics and stuff. But uh, as he been going to prove in his later career, and that he was an absolute warrior to the absolute core. Yeah, very inexperienced Holyfield coming into this one. Many people thought it would be too early for him and he'd be too green to deal with the strength and experience that Carwe was bringing into the ring. Carwe, don't forget, as Andy said, had knocked out um, the excellent Matthew Saad Mohammed a couple of times and he'd uh, sneaked in a couple of WBC title defences as well in between. He was he was a lot more experienced, Dave, and there was also a great size discrepancy. Carwe was listed by ESPN as five foot six in this contest for a cruiserweight. I mean, some people elsewhere list him as five foot seven, even as tall as five foot nine. But ESPN had him down as five foot six. Either way, as I said at the beginning in the intro, he was built like a slab of concrete. Carwe, the thick neck, built like a tree trunk in Holyfield. The body beautiful, tall and slender. One statistic we didn't have in the tail of tape: Holyfield has a twenty. Waist is against uh, Cowie's 36 inch waist, so they can't switch trunks when this fight is over. <laughs> And a genial, sort of humble guy outside of the ring, despite his dodgy upbringing and his, his background in prison, Dave. He seemed like a nice guy, Cowie, but boy, could he fight. I am not too familiar with Cowie's career. I, I've seen this fight now, watched it in preparation for this episode, um, watched uh, him against Old Man Foreman and watch the rematch with Holyfield. Now I really want to look him up. I want to see like his whole career. I mean, that was, that was tremendous. Uh, the guy's fascinating. Um, I love his, his style. I'd love, cause I, I'm a huge Joe Frazier fan. Love that style. Uh, lo- his poker face may be the best I've ever seen in boxing. He doesn't get hit with everything, but what he does get hit with big shots. He doesn't let, doesn't let you show it at all. He grins. He, 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 he calls you in. Uh, he has a lot of good posing and acting in the, in the ring to psych his opponents out. And it's not just uh, technique and skill. It's uh, it's also a sort of emotional battle there. Um, how can you not be a fan of him after watching this fight? It was, it was tremendous, tremendous effort from a veteran in Kawi and tremendous effort from the up-and-comer Holyfield. And the story is just fascinating. Like when I watch an, an old fight that I have not seen before, um, I... I found that trying to put myself in a position of how would I, as the boxing fan that I am today, have have felt in that context, in that position, watching that fight live for the first time. And I think that really helps kind of contextualize it. Um, the way it unfolds, I mean, it, there's so many uh, emotions going on as a viewer even. Uh, how would you have felt about this, this, this upstart kid? Who would you be rooting for? Uh, how would you... How would you bet in play? Um, just a fascinating, fascinating uh, shift of momentum as that fight went along. Yeah, Dave mentioned the George Foreman fight there. Considering Carwee's uh, stature, it's quite remarkable that he went in with a guy as big as Foreman and lasted for seven or eight rounds or however long it went. He was very 
uh, resemblance of Joe Frazier, as Andy said, stylistically. And Holyfield coming in, he had the big back in Holyfield. I think he got about hundred grand, hundred thousand dollars for this fight. Considering, I mean, it was a world title fight, but considering his inexperience, they were really backing him and really fancying him. Very experienced corner team as well. Lou Duva, George Benton as well. He was in Oliver McCall's corner. Very experienced guys. Just looking early on in the fight, Andy, the first Holyfield was finding a home for his right hand early on, and Carwe. He was very good at using his diminutive stature to his advantage, I thought. You know, he tucked up in a ball, presented a very small target, plenty of upper body movement. He was always moving the head and he he used his size and the fact that he was so small to his advantage. And he was giving Holyfield problems early on, Andy, you know, trying to get in underneath Holyfield's jab. set a high pace as well and I think that was probably the, the, uh, the right move to try and make actually especially with his experience um, you know the question mark was 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 Holyfield going to be able to you know was he going to tank it uh, so you know, for the first three four rounds he was really putting it heavy on on a uh, Holyfield and I think he'd even been warned a couple of times for some low blows but if you, if you go back and look at it I think some of the low blows were actually kind of borderline certainly on the belt anyway but um, I don't know if anybody noticed it especially in round four uh, probably about a minute left around actually he kind of he, he, he hurts Holyfield with a big right hand actually it does shake him up you can actually see the, the way Holyfield kind of retreated there that punch blocked by Holyfield glancing right and, and Holyfield stumbled with that left right it clipped a little bit on the jaw but he stumbled Cowie breathing very heavily but he is relentless a left and a right combination again boy that combo has worked well for Holyfield Sliding away. And then if you look at like in round five, you know, Kawi's coming and he's banging hard and you could just basically see, you know, Holyfield tired and I think it was even something that maybe Lou Duva maybe touched upon in his book as well, is that he was you know, that was the the big concern that when they got him back to the kind of the corner run about kind of round six or round seven and stuff, they were kinda of like really telling him, look, start kinda of like aiming for the shoulder, you kind of aim for the arms, try and break up his guard a bit because you know, as you say, just the way way he kinda of, Put his arms up and stuff like that, bobbed and weaved, got inside and just unleashed hellish, hellish hooks. You know, but it was, again, I just think if you, looking at it, especially like say the, the guy who remained in Holyfield's corner through everything, doesn't matter, your trainers came and went. The one person that stayed with him actually was a guy called Tim Tim Hallmark, who, if you go and look at his website and stuff like he's worked with numerous, numerous amounts of fighters and athletes and stuff. Again, you know, all, all the information's out there. I mean, we can mention about the, the pseudonym as well, um, Evan Fields, later on in his career and stuff like that. But just uh, just looking at it, you could just basically see kind of like Holyfield coming out early doors and some rounds that really expending a lot of energy, throwing a lot of punches, trying to kind of stamp his authority and stuff like that. And on we go to round three, scheduled for 15. Holyfield, a couple of big punches from the left and another one from the right. He's only in round three, and he's using so much energy. Exactly right. The point I was trying to make before that flurry. If he has any doubts about his stamina. But then, as the, as the round kind of got into the, kind of like the middle half of the round, that like you could always see Kelby kind of getting his hooks off and always getting inside and making his shots count and stuff like that. It was just the, the experience factor, but you could tell that, that Holyfield was kind of learning on the job as that fight went along. this fight out in the center of the ring and Cowie wants to fight it on the ropes and in the corners just the way he did with Leon Spinks in his last defense it is a 20 foot ring yeah he certainly was I mean in after uh, the first couple of rounds were fairly quiet but in the third Holyfield really came out firing on the instructions of his corner and trying to put it on Carway. as Andy mentioned there Dave in the fourth round it really was a, a really good round Carway digging in hard to the body but Holyfield firing back with some shots and Carway ended up with a sort of puffy left eye, which bothered him throughout the fight. The eye damage really started early. Still, I have not seen blood, but they did use that frozen piece of metal known as an end swell and did apply Vaseline above his left eye. Well, Dwight has taken punches, uh, taken a lot of shots from Evander, especially right hands on that eye, and there is swelling. And then in the, fo- in the fifth round, Holyfield, as a few people had predicted, was maybe starting to feel the pace a little bit. Right now, Evander's just backing all over the ring. 
He just doesn't have the strength right now to resist Dwight or to make him respect him with his punch. He's got to eventually plant his feet and drill some shots and then move. But I mean, it was really good stuff for the first five or six rounds and pretty much nip and tuck, Dave. Yeah, I, had, I gave the first three to Holyfield and gave the second three to Cowie. Um, I felt Holyfield tired a little bit, um, lost his, his first win, kind of uh, left him. And he was a pretty fast starter at in most of the rounds in this fight. He would come out and flurry. You just saw Holyfield. He is devastating right now. He is just outspeeding the champion. He's doing everything he has to do. And then would sort of uh, wilt a little bit, and then Kawi would answer him. And it depended how much, how big the answer was uh, as to whether I would give him the round or not, uh, at least for the first half of the fight. Uh, Kawi really put it on him, I think, in those rounds four, five, and six. And if I had been watching it live at the time, I would have thought, well, this this kid Holyfield, I mean, he's he's bit off more than he can chew here. He can't. He's a, he'd only gone eight rounds before this. I would have figured he he, he went he uh, he shot his wad and he's he's going to get brutally beaten down here because I'd seen it. I've seen that so many times in, in with other fighters. Um, but it turned out, of course, that Holyfield is the man we all know he is uh, today, and he's so, so something truly special. I think you can definitely see the greenness of Holyfield in his movement. He pulls straight back a lot, and that got him caught. Uh, as for the body work, Kawi definitely had the edge in body work, but I don't think it was uh, that, hurtful, that hurtful of Holyfield. Um, I think the headshots from both guys were more effective, and I think Holyfield really neglected the body, actually, in this fight because... Um, in other fights, he is a better body puncher, although it is a failing of his uh, that he, he can be a headhunter. He, he goes a bit wild oftentimes when he gets hit. That's like that's the, sort of the cliche about Holyfield. Great boxer, then he gets hit, sucked into a fight once he gets hit and uh, goes in, becomes a crazy person. Um, and he did that at times in this fight, um, though he did also show discipline and even in the later rounds. Punching low again there is Kowloon. No Durba saying, yelling from the corner, turn him, turn him, spin him around, get off the ropes, and finally, Holyfield is able to do that. But I think that if he'd worked the body or, uh, more in the fight, especially early, I think he might have been able to stop Kawi late. Yeah, it's interesting Dave mentioned the body there, actually. Obviously, I don't want to go too far ahead of ourselves, but I noticed in the rematch, uh, George Benton was making a point of telling Evander whenever Kawi leans in and tucks himself into the turtle shell, throw the right hook to the body around the liver and Holyfield was doing that to soften up Carway. so they'd obviously learned their lesson from the first fight Dave and noticed that like you said yeah and in this fight too uh, George Bent was telling him land that left hook to the body you're landing it really well but you're just not putting quite enough on it and this was late late in the fight so it was a little bit late for him to uh, really sit down on it um, but meanwhile you had Lou Duva telling Holyfield I th- uh, fight fight an amateur fight for the next three rounds. This was in the 12th. Um, so it was kind of conflicting advice from the two trainers. I think Holyfield ultimately decided to go with Benton's plan, judging by the way those last three rounds went. But uh, I I don't know. I, I Both both kind of game plans had their merits there, uh, but it seemed like there was a, a sort of lack of consensus among Holyfield's corner about what he should do. Cowie ran across the ring. There was some confusion in the Holyfield corner. He didn't have his mouthpiece in. That's an unusual mistake with as much experience as there is in that Holyfield corner for George Benton and Lou Duba not to get the mouthpiece in. Yeah, Andy, uh, just looking in, around the middle round, six to seven and eight, um, there was a sequence in the sixth round that I, I put down in my notes where Carby's head movement was just amazing. The way he was bobbing and weaving and avoiding Holyfield's combinations, it was just superb stuff to watch. And here's Holyfield. Holyfield and came back and landed punches of his own. You just have to watch Dwight very closely. People throw a lot of punches at him, but surprisingly few get home. You saw the smiling shrug from 33-year-old Dwight Muhammad Cowie. And I, I, I remember reading a while ago, and I dug the comment out, Roy Jones Jr. actually said that Carway had the best jab ever for a small guy. So it's pretty high praise from the man himself, Jones. Tucking up into the ninth, 10th round, Holyfield was well on his way. 
to landing over a thousand punches in the fight altogether. I suppose it was a fifteen round contest, Andy, but a high output by both guys over a thousand punches. Um, no problems in the fitness for Holyfield as well, which people had concerns over. Just watching these two go at it, there's no way that I can imagine this one going fifteen. Yeah, apparently it was over a thousand punches each. That they that they that thrown but as I say um, I think it was about round 8 and stuff like that that was when you know Holyfield's corner were kind of like that was a big concern once he got to the 8th what was it going to be like um, and as you say I think um, what round was it was it round 6 I think it was you say uh, or round 5 I think it was round 6 when Holyfield came out with that blustering set of combinations and he, he just he never landed a single yeah. single punch just because of that head movement but by the 8th you know, they were glad you could see Holyfield kind of getting his stamina back because, you know, during the ninth, well, before the ninth, they'd been dumping ice water on him and stuff and he came out, he was jabbing more, landing the kind of odd right hand, but Kawhi was still kind of eating up the shots a wee bit. Um, but by, but round 11, you know, he's, Holyfield was jabbing more, he's circling more. Um, and then he just kind of like really roared into life kind of late in that 11th round, really kind of finished it strong. Um, both were really kind of tired by this point, about eleven and twelve. But you could just see that you know, while Kelly was you know slightly more kind of worn and stuff like that, you could see kind of Holyfield coming on strong early, kind of especially at the start of rounds and stuff. He was really coming on strong, uh, trying to kind of really kind of put his stamp on it and stuff. But um, you know, again, credit to Kelly. I mean, even though he was he wasn't probably as active around about the tenth and eleventh and stuff like that, he was still stepping forward. He was still taking shots, and he was still you know here and there getting his own shots off as well. Um, there's there's no theories about it, but I th- I think you know once they get into the kind of ninth and tenth and stuff, there was there was absolutely no doubt there was any concerns about about uh, about Holyfield's stamina or whatever to to kind of go the the hard fifteen rounds. And to be honest, he actually did. He, he did it. He did go the fifteen, but uh, how he suffered in making that fifteen rounds was was something else. Because in the end, you know, it's it's considered like one of the greatest. What's well, the greatest cruiserweight fight in history? It's often kind of ranked in the top fifty of greatest fights of all time. It's interesting you bring that up because I think that the fight took more out of Kawi than it did Holyfield. Obviously, Holyfield had a, a long career after this. Uh, it only ended recently. Um, but I think the youth was a huge factor in terms of Holyfield's ability to bounce back from this ridiculously toll-taking war. I mean, the, the punishment he endured at some points, I mean, it, it, it's the kind of punishment that takes years off your career. And um, being so young, I mean, most guys don't have this kind of fight at this age. Um, I think it would have been even less impactful to him if he if he'd done it at 22, because it's, it's usually 22, 23 is when the body tends to stop growing, tends to stop maturing in, in many ways. And uh, the things you do to your body have a long, longer lasting impact after those years. So yeah, I think it was very, uh, it was a crazy risk to take. I um, mean, they had a lot of confidence in their man to take this fight um, after only 12 fights at age 23 against a very savvy veteran. Um, but it paid off. And I think they didn't really suffer too much of a penalty for it. Holyfield learned a ton of it, ton from it, but uh, I think didn't suffer much physically from the punishment uh, long-term. Yeah, mentioning the uh, the physical nature of the fight as well, in around 14, I think it was the commentator finally said that he thought Carway was just a little bit too heavy. That was one of the problems was uh, we've talked about his stature and him being a lot smaller, but the commentator started to think that it was affecting him. He was carrying a bit too much weight. In the last three rounds, Andy, I think Holyfield sort of got his tactics spot on. It was This was exemplified in about round 13. Holyfield would start the rounds with heavy flurries and set the tone for the round. which means we have a maximum of three to go. Alex, how would you summarize the 12 we've seen so far? I think Evander has just had a little bit more energy, a little bit more punching and combination, throw more punches and landed more. I have him ahead by four points at this stage. There could be a lot of people who disagree with me, especially people who give points for aggression. Dwight has done almost all of the aggressiveness, aggression in terms of coming in throughout the fight. And Holyfield, as he has, coming out strong in the early part of the round. Teeing off on the head of Kawhi. Kawhi trying to cover up. Now let's see if history repeats itself again. Will Kawhi come lunging back at Holyfield, who has used up too much energy? Of course he will. 
but he does not have, he's just been worn down a little bit too much right now. He just can't come back with enough to make up for what uh, Holyfield did. Right now, Dwight's well behind in this round, after, with a minute gone in the round. And then Corey was required to play catch-up and try and swing the, the round and the bout back into his favour. It was clever from Holyfield. He started off fast, set the pace in the round, and then he sort of slowed down. But Corey was always under pressure to try and play catch-up, as I said before, because Holyfield had started so well. Maybe an energy preservation tactic or something, but quite clever f- from uh, Evander. So, but kind of managing the championship rounds, isn't it? I mean, again, if, if, if you can get the judges' eyes on the start of the round and the end of the round... Um, you know, sometimes people kind of forget it, but it's actually happened in the middle part of the round when they try to score it. But no, you're right enough. I mean, I thought the corner were like, you know, by the 13th, of like, you know, stay away, you know, jab, you know, turn, you know, get out, get out with the side of that kind of that left hook. But by the round, by round 14, Cowie wasn't even thrown anywhere near this as to what he did kind of way earlier in the fight. Absolutely none whatsoever. Um, you know, by the 15th, though, you know, both came out hard, really hard. Actually, I didn't think, you know, given considering. You know, the, the time of year, the climate that they're, that they're fighting in, you know, they come out in the 15th round like that, just to kind of, both of them going to war, landing heavy right hands. You know, I think um, Holyfield gave a bit of ground attempting to jab and kind of cover up and slip the kind of shots. And he kind of flurried late in the round and he backed Cali up with, you know, who kind of stuttered a wee bit. I didn't think he was maybe hurt, but he did think they stuttered a wee bit. And he kind of attempted to respond, trying to kind of go for a KO. And you could, you know, I, we were talking about this when we were just before we were ready to record it, actually, you know, if unless you're actually kind of really paying attention to the fight, Cal Wee was actually deducted a point during the the fifteenth round. It was actually in play at the time. Um, it must have been. I, I didn't even know what the infraction was for. I remember it was for like trying to hold or maybe another low blow or whatever it was. But I, I didn't think kind of trying to trigger a response for Cal Wee to try and go for the knockout. I think it must have been for low blowing because to be to be honest, he was hitting low. Uh, in the majority of the rounds of the night, he must have landed at least two low blows. Um, not None of them too serious, like right in the nuts where you like have to fall down. But they were definitely uh, below the belt and probably effective too because Holyfield was not blocking there as most fighters don't tend to. Yeah, it was a bit of a strange one that the commentator mentioned at the end of the fight. The referee had signaled to him, indicated to the commentary team that uh, Carly had had a point deducted. There was no sort of stopping the time, time out, take the fighter to the middle of the ring and explaining very clearly that a point had been deducted. So that's obviously something the rules that has improved because that was ridiculous. The referee didn't make that clear at all in real time. I was just told by referee Vinnie Renone that there was a point taken away for a low blow from Cowie. So still to come, the much-awaited decision. Is Evander Holyfield's dream come true? Or has Cowie withstood the storm? And what a storm it was to hold on to his championship belt. We got to the decision in the end after a stirring 14th and 15th round. And uh, who was going to get it? I'm sure you all know by this point. Harold Lederman was on the scoring mm-hmm. team at HBO Scorer now. Had it 144 to 140 to the new champion Holyfield. Gordon Volkman had it 143, 141 to Carway retaining. And then Nefi Quintana went quite wide, actually, 138 to 147. And we have a new champion. You might be able to see from Dwight's face that he recognises that he gave everything he had. But today, against the Vander Holyfield, it was not enough. Cowie. Uh, the Ring magazine named Holyfield Carway uh, the first fight as the best cruiserweight fight of the 1980s. A much maligned division, the cruiserweights, Andy. The Americans mm-hmm. have never really had too much interest in it, but Ring magazine again ranked this fight as the 46th greatest title fight in any division of all time back in 1996. Whether it's cruiserweight or not, and whether the Americans like this division or not, this was a hell of a fight. A tremendous fight, mate. Um, if, it, I, I, if you've not seen it, you must, you must go and watch it. I mean... If you, if, especially if you're a fan of heavyweight boxing, you want to know how F- Holyfield came up and stuff. You got your start here, but um, yeah, again, as it says, you know, okay, he'd, um, he'd, he didn't really kind of have the names in his record at that point. Granted, the the Cali fight is again, as I says, eleven and zero against a, a seasoned, proven veteran like a, a two weight world champion who done it on the road. You know, really good division, and not many people will probably know us at the time, but the the weight class at cruiserweight at that time was one hundred and ninety pounds. Because they were trying to kind of encourage the kind of, you know, obviously the late, some light heavyweight guys would be too big for, you know, too small, sorry, for heavyweight back like they did, say, like Bob Foster kind of challenged Muhammad Ali. You know, he was just he was far too small. He even fought Joe Frazier, who licked him in like two or three rounds and stuff. 
and gradually that weight division went from one ninety to two hundred pounds because you know you did have a kind of smaller heavyweights who just simply just you know because the heavyweights were getting far far bigger than that the guys just simply couldn't compete. But uh, as we as we're seeing in the present day just now actually you know the cruiserweight division you know especially over the course of the last what five six seven years and stuff it's always been value for money. You can go back to James Tony against Yarov. Um, we're not, we're not getting into Johnny Nelson's running a terror at cruiserweight and stuff, you know. But if you look at like mm-hmm. if you look at like some Marco Hook, for example, he had a lot of exciting fights in that, you know, especially against Olaf Afalabi. I think it was maybe the second fight, absolute war. Uh, Dennis Lebedev has been in a great war against Guillermo Jones. Ocho Caso, okay, some people might might not remember him and stuff, but he's a he had a, he was a two maybe a three year uh, reigning champion. Jean Marc Against Fagamini was a good fight, wasn't it as well? As well, I was going to say Mormick against O'Neill Bell. The first fight was really, really good. Oh, um, brilliant. So you know, it's, it's a, you know, Arslan. Can't forget Arslan. Yeah, that fight against the against Marco Hook. So it's been it's, it's a division that doesn't get a lot of respect. Doesn't get a lot of kind of airtime. Um, as you say, Steve, it's not really kind of really build a lot in the in the states. Doesn't get kind of HBO, Showtime, kind of mainstream kind of uh, viewing and stuff. But you know. Between the hardcore fans and stuff like that, the guys that really watch the sport or are invested in it, like that, these guys know that this division really, you know, most of the time delivers great, great fights. And this was, as you said, one of the greatest fights in history. You know, 46th greatest fight of all time, the greatest cruiserweight fight in history, and probably the very last fight, or probably the, the very last fight to go 15 rounds, it was probably the best ever, you know. So, you know, it was. I- I was going to ask about the cruiserweight division. I mean, it must have just been born in 1986 because you hear the commentators kind of um, not really talking about it as though it's established. They they say uh, early on in the fight that it's just the WBC and the IBF that have sort of acknowledged its existence and they call it the cruiserweight division. He's sort of explaining it to the uh, mm-hmm. listeners as though they would never have heard of it before. So it must have been brand new. This is the division that the WBC and IBF call the cruiserweight division. It was like junior heavyweight, I think they called it at one point, even. It was depending, depending on what kind of division or what title it was at the time. I think the WBC called it the kind of light um, junior heavyweight division, do you say? Um, I think around about that time, it was, it was at Marvin Kamel. He fought uh, Matt Parlov, the big Croatian uh, fella. Yeah, that was the early 80s or maybe uh, in the late 70s, wasn't it? I think uh, then you've got Carl Sugar De Leon came in here, then you've got Ozzy Ocaso and Marvin Kimmel, kind of like. So, uh, run about the kind of like the late 70s, early 80s, this is when the division kind of came into play. So, you didn't really kind of have a kind of bona fide, you know, legit champion, you know. So, I think if you look at the likes, if you go through the records, maybe watch some of the fights now, you would probably put, like I said, Marvin Kimmel and Carlos De Leon uh, and ST Gordon would probably be a kind of like lineal, kind of like, you know real champions rather than kind of like the, the alphabet stuff so you would be saying like saying you know delay almost I think was considered maybe a kind of three-time lineal champ or whatever but again as I say the division wasn't that strong at the time and stuff and it wasn't really getting the respect and it wasn't until like the kind of like Holyfield kind of came through after Holyfield after Holyfield actually kind of vacated the title we never got another lineal champion again at Cruiserweight until uh, O'Neill, Bell, uh, O'Neill Bell fought for it and you had more mech David Hay, then Thomas Adamek was the last person uh, until obviously uh, next year, until we get a kind of clear winner from the WBS Cruiserweight tournament. Yeah, after this fight in 1986, both of their careers took uh, quite divergent paths, really. Holyfield went from strength to strength. As for Carway, he had a, a nondescript win against a lesser opponent, and then he was he lost a majority decision to Ozzy Acacio, who was a decent fighter, went up to heavyweight eventually, I think. Then another win over in France, and then the rematch. Uh, in, the, in the meantime, uh, Mr. Holyfield had defended his WBA cruiserweight title against Henry Tillman, Many people might be, remember that name. Tillman had beaten Mike Tyson in the Olympic qualifiers. Uh, Tyson, of course, avenged that in the pros. And Holyfield had won the IBF Cruiserweight title against Ricky Parkey and also defended it against the aforementioned Ocasio before the car, uh, the car we rematch happened a year later. They were really active fighters back then. I think Holyfield had about four fights in that year period before the rematch. But by this point, Dave, I don't know if you've managed to catch the rematch or not, um, Holyfield had worked Carwee out. Carwee was starting to look a little bit washed, I thought. He was starting to look like a small guy. Holyfield managed to attack the body. And the the funny thing about this was, I was watching the ESPN version earlier for uh, for the first time in many years, and Dr. Ferdy Pacheco was on the commentary team, and he kept saying, oh, you know, Carwee, he's fine. He's not hurt. Every time Holyfield visibly hurt him, he's just playing. It's okay. He's he's made of toughness, this guy. And then all of a sudden, in the fourth round, it was like, (laughs) oh, 
Oh, no, he didn't get knocked down from a left hook. It was okay. It was a flash <laughs> knockdown, is, is I believe exactly what he said when he went down. And then the second knockdown happens, and he's basically flat on his face. And, uh, I mean, even Pacheco has to acknowledge, yeah, he's done. Um, I think that uh, Kawi was that, – that was the first time he was stopped, and he'd been through hell. Uh, I mean, some of the names he fought, tough, really tough guys. Michael Spinks, good puncher. Um, that was apparently – I never seen the fight. I want to look it up now because apparently, according to the judges, it was just about as close as, as Holyfield Colby was. Um, I don't know if you guys have seen that, but, I mean, that's a hell of a, a, a tough fight. Uh, Saad Muhammad, obviously, then that war with Holyfield at age 33. Um, I think that really – was the beginning at the end for him because even during the fight, you can see it. The you can see the narrative play out. I mean, Kawi after in about the thirteenth round. The thirteenth round is uh, where he really starts to finally show some effect of the punches he's been taking all night long. I mean, that poker face was phenomenal, but it finally starts to shift in the thirteenth, and he he starts becoming inactive. And Holyfield just beat the hell out of him in that 13th round. If he had, if, if Kawi had been more visibly hurt, I probably would have given that a 10, eight. Um, Cause it was just so dominant for Holyfield. But I think that gap there between like the, that, that 13th round was sort of the beginning of the end of his, his career. I think he be, he became washed up in that fight. Um, not completely washed up. I mean, every guy has a little something left. I mean, Eric Morales was washed up for years and then kept coming back to show us a little something. Um, there's different levels of washed up, but I think that was the beginning of the end. And uh, I mean, yeah, the the rematch with Kawi sort of reminds me of the rematch Holyfield had with Michael Moore. I mean, obviously Moore beat him narrowly in the first fight. Um, it's a disputable decision. Holyfield looked horrible in that first fight and looked sick. I, he claims he was sick. Who really knows? Uh, Holyfield's career can't really completely be discussed with uh, without talking about the substances. But uh, either way, the the rematch was just a dominant beatdown. Um, and I, what something else Holyfield improved in the second fight, even though he didn't really have too much time to show it, and and Kawi was somewhat listless, was uh, he threw in some lateral movement. He would he would pivot a lot more, and that I think was helpful. He did not do that nearly enough in the first fight, and that got him caught pulling straight back several times with overhand rights. I mean, Kawi didn't show a lot of technique in terms of his. In terms of how he set punches up, it was just, I think, what what made him so successful in the fight was his experience and the way he timed his attacks because he picked the perfect moments when Holyfield had just finished a rally and was and was a little worn out, when Holyfield was moving back with his hands down. He picked the perfect moments to just swing wild and he would catch him frequently. So, I mean, I think it was just a really, he, it was, and I, I would give uh, Kawi the power edge in this first fight because of that, because of the timing in which he chose to attack. He, he chose to attack when Holyfield was worn out. He chose to attack when he was moving backwards, defenseless. And he had that old man's strength um, and experience. I think he actually shook up Holyfield a few times in the first half of the fight, even maybe a little bit in the 15th round, uh, kind of caught him off guard with that last stand. Um, so I would say that the power edge really shifted between the first fight and the rematch. Yeah, Kawi went on for a good 10 or 11 years after that, even campaigning at times up at heavyweight. We mentioned the George Foreman fight. Uh, I've heard Kawi interviewed uh, just watching YouTube videos a few times, and he, he is quite hard to understand. So he is someone who's paying the price for all those ring wars. But considering the start of his life, a bit like Bernard Hopkins, obviously he didn't go on to have as much success as Hopkins. But uh, if, if at 25 you're coming out of prison with no real prospects and you're going on to have a career like Dwight Muhammad Kawi did or Dwight Braxton, as he was known earlier in his career, then you, you pretty much did something right. And uh, Dave mentioned the Michael Spinks fight there. It was a decent fight. I was never a big Spinks fan, to be honest with you. Um, and I thought that it, it was fairly close. As for Holyfield, Andy, he got the unification all sorted at Cruiserweight, which is a hell of a feat against Carlos De Leon. He added the WBC title to his WBA and IBF World Cruiserweight crowns. No WBO dragging us down at that point in time in 1988. And then moved on up to heavyweight. Some excellent fights to the likes of Alex Stewart, Burt Cooper, uh, James Buster Douglas, of course, in 1990. And um, it's hard to it's hard to say too much about Holyfield's career. I mean, one hell of a fighter. Great fighter, mate. I mean, if I, w- one of the greatest lines I ever heard in commentary, actually, was probably during the, the first fight against Riddick Bowe in the 10th round when he's badly hurt 
and uh, Larry Merchant comes up with the, the, the comment. He says, um, if he weighs two hundred and five pounds, his heart weighs two hundred and four. Uh, it was just the mark of the man. He just, you know, when he was hurt, he was at his most dangerous. Um, just, you know, if you go to the kind of third fighting against Redick Bow, actually, I think, I don't, you know, remember we had this big drama about the heart complaint and all that sort of stuff. I, I don't believe it. I think what we were seeing there was a guy who was basically kind of struggling with the effects of taking steroids. Basically, I think that's what it is. I mean, if you look at kind of Tommy Morris against Ray Mercer, um, you can see the pimples in his back and stuff. And, you know, they kind of believed because he was messing with the gear and stuff, he was going to, he was going to gas within five, six rounds, and that's what happened. I think that's what's maybe what's happened to. To the whole field now, fight you kind of maybe gassed out. I mean, obviously, you know, as I say, it's going way back to the kind of the, the first fight against, uh, well, before fighting Carl Wee. You know, the project was to try and get him up to heavyweight at some point and, you know, fight Tyson because there's there's that great story actually when the two of them sparred, you know, up at Catskills, they were, uh, they were playing pool and Tyson's kind of like walking about owning the place and he's bullying the other kids and that in the, in the kind of recreation area and, uh, and walked Holyfield and, uh, Stare down happens, and who shit the bed first? It was Mr. Tyson. Holyfield wasn't going anywhere. Holyfield was the man. He he saw the bully in, in Tyson way, way back, and they were really confident about, about that fight. And I think how he looked against Holy against Riddick Bow, and then actually going to fight Tyson a year later and stuff, when a lot of people actually, especially Tyson coming out of prison at that point, the way Holyfield had been looking up to that point, you'd be thinking to themselves, well, is he ready to go? But then he comes back and he puts on a, a great performance. Is if is, is that on because of the case of Evan Evan Fields? Who knows? But um, as as for Cal Wee, I mean, just I heard he's mentioned the George Foreman fight a couple of times and stuff. It was after the the rematch against Holyfield. He actually took that fight on, on on two days' notice. By which point he was addicted to alcohol, um, which in the end probably kind of ended his career. But um, in the end, he, he became a. a a drink, a sort of alcohol and uh, drugs away, counsellor and stuff. Um, as you say, Steve, he didn't have much prospects coming out of prison, became a fighter, and then in 2004, he got inducted into the Hall of Fame, which, to be honest, is, is you know, it's well-deserved, considering how he, you know, especially the opponents he kind of went through, or had to fight through, and especially the early 80s and that, I mean, that, that was the who's who, the light heavyweight division. Michael Spinks, I know, I know he wasn't kind of always great to watch, but he was uh, very technically sound. Yeah. Only one loss ever. Yep, and it was Mike Tyson, but um, again, again, yeah, I think Spinks actually kind of fought the kind of same opponents that uh, the whole, uh, the Holyfield that uh, Cal Wee went through as well. They all did, didn't they? Really, Andy yep. back then, Marvin Johnson, Mohammed, all yep. these type of fellas. Yeah, and it's not like recycling opponents and stuff like these guys were still kind of like you know dangerous fighters, well yeah, within their, yeah. their own right to kind of get the cusp of a world title fight within their own right. And this is back in a time when really you only had the kind of two titles and the IBF kind of came into play around about the early 80s, 80, I think it was about 83 or something like that, IBF belt came into being, but it was a lot harder to get a title shot back then, so you had to kind of fight these guys to kind of earn your right to get classes of mandatory contender, number one contender or whatever and that, so you know, it was you know, it was good times, you know, especially for the light heavyweight division that was always kind of classed as the bastard child of the the boxing world until the cruiserweight division, who's now kind of taken on that mantle. I just wanted to me- me- discuss Holyfield's career a little bit first on the the roids thing. I mean, I mean, it's pretty clear he <laughs> the Evan Fields uh, investigation made made it made it very clear that this guy was at least dabbled in the stuff. Um, I think I can see I can almost understand how he would have justified it to himself as well because he was small for heavyweight and he probably thought you know. I'm just I'm just making this fight even by bulking up. I'm using this stuff to bulk up. I'm using it to become a heavyweight. You know, uh, I think it had some. It gave his career a boost in some some ways, uh, but also se- seriously hampered him. Um, it, 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 the, his excuse for uh, Holyfield. I mean, he was a great warrior, but he did uh, tend to make excuses at times for his losses, especially later in his career. He always blamed the shoulder injury or something or something or other, but. Uh, in that that third bow fight, he was kicking Bo's ass at times, outboxing him, uh, and Bo was not in the best of shape either at that point. Um, but his energy levels were going up and down, and I think that had to be uh, roid related. They said he had a a hole in his heart, and he went to a faith healer who like put his hand on his forehead, and he collapsed and was magically healed. <laughs> I forgot uh, about that. <laughs> And uh, then Holyfield's excuse actually for the Bo three fight. Uh, this is the one I heard during the uh, Legendary Knights HBO documentary. He said he ate some bad seafood, and that's why his energy kept going up and down. He would have these spells of 
greatness and then just he, he was completely gassed and I mean, it was really his energy that, that led to him losing that fight but also notice that in that that bow fight that was one of the first fights in which he's totally bald and he has a he has that body that he had in his later career which is more of a heavyweight body um bigger shoulders bigger around all up top um and uh, i i think that uh, even in the the fight with michael moore when his energy just seemed completely strange that he blamed the the hole in his heart on that fight as well. I believe I don't, I don't think we'll ever really know the truth and all the details. Uh, but it's, 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 it's not just a black and white issue. And, uh, I think that Holyfield is not just an evil man for, for his, his PED use and, uh, his achievement is not totally muted because of it. Um, Though I think we can say safely that he was on it. And I think that roids, especially back then, I mean, uh, drugs have been improving. PEDs have been improving over the years a lot. Uh, they were, they've were they always been pretty risky. I think uh, a lot of football players blame them for uh, totally ruining their lives in the 60s, 70s, 80s, uh, to- and, and being responsible for their deaths. Um, they were very unhealthy. And I think some of these earlier roids, they weren't designer drugs. I think they hurt guys' careers. I think they hurt Holyfield's career possibly even more than they helped his career. Can't say that for sure. I don't think we'll ever know. I think they hurt Shane Mosley's career. I think there's other guys' careers that steroids have definitely hurt. Um, I'm not sure if that's how it is these days. I kind of doubt it. But I think in boxing history, roids have not necessarily always been a boon. Um, Also, I wanted to talk about just uh, as far as Holyfield's career this night, uh, what, I guess it was his 13th fight or 12th fight. This is the night you get to see him become a man. Um, you can see it at it, the confidence um, just kind of come out of him in that 13th round. I mentioned before how he just comes out there and beats the hell out of Kawi. He realizes I'm, I'm meant to be here. I can do the, the 15 round distance. Um, he really matured. He must've learned so much from this fight. Um, a, a veteran with, he, in before this Holyfield, uh, the beginning of his career was he didn't look great. He looked a little shaky. Some of his fights went the distance that probably shouldn't have some of those four rounders. Um, even in the Olympics, he fell short, you know, um, it wasn't, it was, it was probably a, a, certainly an unnecessary disqualification, but you know, it's still not a gold medal. And, uh, I think he took bronze. Uh, it just seemed like he was going to be like an almost there guy. And I, I, if I put myself in a position, like if I was back, if I was a boxing fan at the time, I probably wouldn't have had much faith in Holyfield until this great night when he, he just, he really came into his own. And a, um, Sorry, that was a long rant. <laughs> no, no, not at all, Dave. That's absolutely fine. You were going to mention the uh, Holyfield collapsing just before you do. We're just going on to our scorecards. Um, I hope my maths has held up here. I know I had a couple of shameful 10-10 rounds thrown into here. I think I ended up with it 144, 139 or something in around those regions. If you want to give us your scorecard and also tell us about Holy uh, collapsing after the first fight. I had it 144, 141 because... Even though I'd read officially that the point had been deducted, um, I didn't really kind of deduct it because I didn't look like the ref gave it officially and stuff like that. You know, that was just kind of back there. But probably I gave it to Holyfield by by, by three points. Yeah, but you know, after the fight, um, as I guess, as I say, as many during the show there, there, because um, it's during July, um, because of the kind of you know the the, the heat and the weather, the, the fighting and stuff, uh, Holyfield ended up losing over twelve pounds and. And, and, and weight so bad that his uh, his kidneys were so dehydrated that actually had to get the bomb was shutting down. Um, he collapsed. He was in the shower. He went to go and do. You know, he went to go go to the toilet anyway. And he, he he thought he was you know was passing blood. It wasn't blood he was passing. It was actually muscle residue that he was his body was so dehydrated. So um, the way them even though that he'd weighed the uh, one hundred and eighty six pounds for the fight. Um, he'd rehydrated, uh, he dehydrated to 176 or something like that. So um, they put the IV into him and uh, he left the hospital with healthy 198. So crazy. It's, it's crazy, it's absolutely crazy. <laughs> I actually had it the exact same way as you. I did not take the point off because I'm still not sure what round the ref meant. I thought he, he scolded him more than the 12th, it seemed. So I... I <laughs> It may have been the fifteenth, but he he seemed to scold. He didn't seem to scold him in the fifteenth. So I don't I don't really know. It, it doesn't matter. I don't think that uh, the point is that relevant. I had Holyfield one forty four, one forty one by three points, nine rounds to six. 
Excellent stuff. I think we'll wrap it up there. One thing I was going to mention, just uh, for clarity, I was calling uh, Mohammed Kali Dwight Braxton earlier. He was one of three fighters who converted to Islam in and around the same time. Uh, I think Matthew Saad Mohammed, who was Matthew Franklin, um, was the first one. And then Eddie Gregory, who became yeah. Eddie Mustafa Mohammed, also um, converted. And Mustafa Mohammed, obviously, he'll be one for another day, an excellent fighter. And everyone knows that I'm a, a big Saad Mohammed fan. These three guys, Andy, uh, s- some superb fights they're involved in over the years. Yeah, it just, it's just so happened that these uh, three guys were actually like heavyweight guys when they, when they actually converted at the time, you know. Just mentioned Eddie Mustafa Muhammad there, you know, Marvin Johnson, absolutely great fight. Um, there was actually a fight early in his career as well. I mean, I think he even, uh, I might be saying that Eddie went to the prison as well and fought James Scott. Um, and there was a couple of other fights early in his career as well as that uh, he was actually tested and bad, badly stopped and or badly. Uh, I need to go and find it for you guys and that, but it was a fight that he, he got dropped and really, really bad. It might be an Eddie Phillips or something. And then he came back and actually iced the guy uh, after it looked like he was ready to go himself. So another great fighter and probably one as well who maybe deserves a, a punch for the past episode put uh, put toward him. Yeah, on Scott, uh, Mustafa Mohammed lost to Scott in the prison in 1978. And Scott is, is quite the character. He fought himself up to contender status in the prison. I think his last 10 fights or whatever all took, all took place in railway state prison so he was quite the character and it was only when Carwee beat James Scott in 1981 that his world title dream was ended but you're quite right Andy in 1978 Scott beat uh, the then undefeated Mustafa Mohammed. any final comments from you Dave you want to make somebody's got to make a documentary on Kawi I mean maybe there is one already out there that's kind of underlooked but I mean what a story and what a life there certainly needs to be a film for the likes of, uh, you're just talking about light heavyweights, and that's where Kyle we started. But guys like Matthew said, Muhammad, they guys deserve, they don't, they, they deserve more than statues. They deserve like a biopic, you know, like, you know, that guy's life alone, you know, no many people would have survived that. All three of them. Yeah, and there's, you know, for example, there's Jim Scott, he's paid his date to the society in 2014. He was suffering from dementia and he's new resident in a nursing home. Um, I think he got out of prison when he was 58. In 2005, you know, and this is a guy who's obviously campaigning to try and get a fight outside prison so he could, I mean, you know, go and fight the, for the for the world titles and that, you know, kind of leave the prison, but he couldn't, he couldn't get that kind of, he was not kind of allowed to leave. Um, but um, I'm trying to remember, I'm sure he, I don't think he actually did fight for the title. I never think he did. Um, no, he didn't, he didn't. So it was a kind of shame, actually, but, you know, I suppose you would pay your dues if he. If you're uh, into that kind of like, you know, I don't know if it was, was it armed robbery or something like that, he got involved in, so 51 years. Heavy, yeah. 51 years. Yeah, quite the stint for Mr. Scott. We shall return to him, no doubt, at some point in the future. Thanks to Andy Patterson there for jumping on the call and Dave the Hater Lowback as well. We're into Series 2 now of Punches from the Past, so thanks to all our Patreon subscribers who are listening to these episodes to, um, every month. Uh, also, don't forget to keep listening to the Sunday Evening Podcast by tunes and all those things but in and for the meantime we're going to leave you thanks to the guys for jumping on and we'll catch you in the next episode of punches from the past make sure you watch this fight guys whatever you do